morning, everybody. Welcome to the Intergovernmental Relations Committee meeting for the Board of County Commissioners. We do have a packed agenda this morning, a very important topic. We have multiple uh, commissioners beyond the committee. We have our city council colleagues, uh, planning commission members, community members. And so we are going to keep this uh, really, really tight today. We are going to start out with introductions. Uh, I will start with the committee members and starting with uh, District 5. Good afternoon. Good evening. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Laura Meyer, and I represent District 5. <laughs> District 6. Good morning. I'm Susan Rodriguez McDowell, and I'm elected by the people of District 6 who are in the house. All right. All right. <laughs> Welcome, District 6 com community members. Uh, Commissioner Leak is also a part of this committee. She is not here right now, uh, but we will throw to her when she comes in. We also have other board members here, our at large members. Uh, and District 1 member, so we'll go with uh, District 1 and then go with our at-large members. Good morning. I am Mecklenburg County Commissioner Elaine Powell, representing North Mecklenburg, but truly representing the entire county. And so I love when District 6 shows up. Uh, good morning. Good morning. I'm Arthur Griffin. I'm a County Commissioner at-large representing the entire county and as well all of the districts. Good morning. My name is Lee Altman, County Commissioner serving at large. Welcome to you all. Thank you. And prior to going to staff, uh, what I would like to do, we also have uh, some of our city council representatives, uh, and I believe the mayor is online, and we'll go with uh, Council Member Mayfield. Good morning, everyone. Luana Mayfield, I serve at large on Charlotte City Council. Thank you. And I do believe we have Mayor Lyles online. Madam Mayor, do you want to bring greetings? Good morning. I'm Vi Lyles and I serve as mayor of the city of Charlotte. Thank you. Uh, Derek, will you do staff introductions, please? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Derek Ramos, deputy county manager and chief of staff for Mecklenburg County. We'll start briefly with county staff and I'll turn to my right. Yes, good morning. Leslie Johnson, deputy county manager. Good morning, Tyrone Wade, county attorney. Carly Godfrey, senior assistant to the county manager. Rebecca Herbert, Community Relations Manager. That's all staff except for our presenters today, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. Um, before we get started with the first presentation, I, I, I want to just um, make sure that we're all clear on our purpose and, and what the agenda is about today. One of the things that we're going to do is we're going to hear from Charlotte Mecklenburg Planning Commission uh, Chair Doug Welton, He'll give us an overview. We'll also um, get some information uh, from Allison Craig, who's here uh, around the UDO uh, overview and impact of the uh, proposed tax amendments that we have with respect uh, to ETJ development. Uh, also, we'll hear from the county attorney, uh, Mr. Wade, uh, around authority and uh, his perspective from a, a board perspective and we also will hear from uh, the public. And so the public will provide feedback to the Board of Commissioner, County Commissioners, and uh, hopefully we will process that information. And before I move any, uh, before I move uh, further, I'd like to acknowledge uh, District 6 Rep, uh, Susan Rodriguez McDowell and our at-large members who uh, Commissioner Altman and Commissioner Griffin and also um, Commissioner Powell, because they've really led this charge on behalf of the community to raise these concerns to make sure that we get clarification. And I think um, it's clear um, the way that they've been leading in this uh, and on this topic. And I wanted to make sure that we lifted you all up to say thank you for bringing these board uh, bringing these concerns uh, to the board. The goal, my specific goals as the chair today will be, uh, number one, we wanted to pull all stakeholders together, bring everybody in the room so that we're not piecemealing things together. We all receive the same amount of information. We all hear it together. And then we can ask our questions and, and figure out where we go. Uh, also, we want to make sure everyone was clear on roles and responsibilities. Who is doing what? so that it doesn't seem like we're kicking the can down the road, passing the buck. Public, you all need to know who has the scope of responsibility over your specific questions to make sure that they're addressed properly, uh, appropriately and properly. The 
third thing that we wanted to make sure that that came out of today is for commissioners to be able to uh, ask questions and receive clarification on any points where we may be disconnected as well. And uh, again, finally, I can't stress this point enough. We make we want to make sure that the public has an opportunity to provide feedback so that the board can hear and we can understand exactly how we'd like to proceed or what we'd like to tee up moving forward. So with that said, I wanted to level set, make sure that we're all on the same page moving forward and so that the public can have a framework and know exactly where you need to go to get your issues addressed. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Doug and let you go. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, happy Father's Day to everybody. Yeah. Um, thank you, Commissioner Gerald, for having me here, uh, other commission members. Uh, nice to see you folks. I'm going to give you um, an overview of the Charlotte Mecklenburg Planning Commission. And uh, at the end, there's time for questions if you have any, and hopefully. Uh, I wrote this presentation last night while listening to Rick James, so there's that. All right. Uh, <laughs> It's true. Uh, did we go anywhere? Did I press the right direction? Is it on? This is the part where we dance, like, because the Rick James music is on. All right. That one? Yep. Bam. Bam. Not bam. Oh. <laughs> no. Hold for one second. Yeah. All right, we're gonna be. We're gonna go. We're good now. All right. All right. We're back in business. Uh, the Charlotte Mecklenburg Planning Commission. Obviously, both names are in there: Charlotte and Mecklenburg. This adventure, as far as I'm concerned or can determine, started on uh, September 9th, 2009. That's the date that's on the interlocal agreement between uh, the city of Charlotte and Mecklenburg County that basically says, we're gonna have a planning commission that's gonna do these things. And um, that covers basically Charlotte's sphere of influence, which is about 310 uh, square miles of Charlotte and about 70 square miles of what you guys would call the ETJ. Um, the purpose of the Charlotte Mecklenburg Planning Commission in the interlocal, it says, to provide an orderly and coordinated growth strategy for the area to have factual and objective process for making decisions. And it also designates the city as the authority to administer all of the um, land use decisions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the Charlotte Mecklenburg Planning Commission is composed of 14 people. Uh, there are seven appointed by the county, seven appointed by the city. Um, we have meetings on the second Monday of each month, uh, usually upstairs. I will also recognize Commissioner Lansdale, who is one of our uh, commissioners who, are you always in the building? <laughs> <laughs> he, is, he, is, he is here and, and uh, I'm glad to have him here. Uh, he's my wingman and if I say something that's stupid, just ask Terry for the correct information. Uh, we are divided into two committees, which I will go into a little bit of detail more later, but those two committees are the planning committee which uh, handles one part of our, our, our uh, responsibilities, and the zoning committee, seven members on each one. We roughly rotate back and forth kind of on a yearly basis or as necessary, try and have a little bit of continuity as we go forward. But the planning commission has three functions that are defined, and those include the following. We are there to review and advise on the sale of real property, sale and purchase of real property. So anytime somebody has a building they want to sell or buy or some land, et cetera, then we get involved in that. We don't get involved in landfills, though. I'm excited that we don't get involved in landfills. And it's specific that it's not no landfills. The second thing we do is re review and advise on long-term um, land use policy, uh, things like the 2040 plan, the unified development ordinance, the policy map, those types of things. And the third thing we do is we uh, review and advise on what I call land use reclassifications. Every piece of property has entitlements, things you can do with it. And if you want to change those, that's usually what we call a rezoning. So that's the third thing we do. 
that also in that mix is the notion of uh, sometimes the, the rules for what you can do with property need to change. That's a text amendment. So when we make changes to the actual regulations, then the zoning committee will do that as well. So let's start with this planning committee. And it's all about the Benjamins, as Puffy would say. Um, and that being the case, the, the planning committee meets on the third Tuesday of each month. And they do two things. They are there to um, review and advise in terms of sale and purchase of real property, and also to review and advise in terms of long-term policy. Now, how do we come to this whole notion of review and advise? Uh, the planning committee is really near the end of the process. If somebody in the city or the county wants to, a, a, an agency wants to sell some property, there's this thing called the Joint Use Task Force. And they get together, and I think it is quarterly. Yeah, they get together. It's about two, do two dozen city agencies, county agencies, and the towns are involved in this as well. And the Joint Use Task Force gets together and basically they barter over what to do with stuff. There's stuff you use, there's stuff you reuse, there's stuff you acquire, there's stuff you dispose of. And that's usually property. And, you know, there's horse trading. And sometimes, you know, Bob says, I don't want, I don't have a use for this anymore. And Cindy says, well, I can use that. So the Joint Use Task Force gets, takes care of things. If someone goes through that entire process and a piece of property is to be sold or acquired, then something called a mandatory referral comes to the uh, planning committee. And we must review and advise on that, that mandatory referral. The mandatory referral process has been around for a long time. 1973 was the date that I saw on uh, the first mandatory referral. So we stopped going to the moon, we created mandatory referrals. That is the way that that works. And everybody knows it. Um, now, what are the criteria for a mandatory referral? It's got to be, we look at it just like we would a rezoning. It's got to be consistent with the land use that's all around. You know, are we going to put a water tower in the middle of Dilworth? Not likely, you know, uh, that sort of thing. Are we going to put a school right next to an industrial site? Not likely, but it's just got to be consistent with the land use policies that we would have otherwise. Other, also, it's got to be consistent with pu public policy. So if, if, city or county has made a policy decision that affects what this mandatory referral is either purchasing or selling, then we have to be consistent with that. We also have to be consistent with capital plans because do you guys have money at the county? I'm just asking, anybody in here know about the money, right? So when you guys spend money, you've made plans and there's that CIP thing, you go get the little map and you can see where stuff is being done. And that those are decisions that are taken into account when we make mandatory referrals. But that, again, happens at our meeting. We see sometimes there's one or two mandatory referrals that come through each month. Sometimes there's a half a dozen. I will say that your buddies over at Park and Rec have been spending like a drunken sailor lately. So we do see a lot of, of uh, mandatory referrals from, from Park and Rec. And uh, that's, you know, that's a part of the process. Um, now, that's the planning committee, all right? So we do, they, they do two things, uh, sale and purchase of, of real property, and also they do this notion of long-term planning. And so let's take a look at that notion. Um, review and advise on comprehensive plans. You guys have heard of the 2040 comprehensive plan. That is a plan for the city in terms of how they're gonna grow. It sets their tent poles for making decisions in terms of how the city is going to grow. The planning committee will review and advise on that. We gave feedback. We said, hey, we like this part, don't like that part. We went to tons of public meetings with folks and did dot maps. Everybody loves dot maps, right? There are also additional types of things that are long-term plans, like the 2040 policy map, which takes those 2040 plans and says, let's put it on the actual geography of this town, okay? If we're going to say this is the kind of housing we can have in a specific area, let's map it so you can actually see that. And then the policy, which is a 2040 plan, becomes, turn, uh, becomes actual uh, ordinance. And that is the unified development ordinance, which says, here's what you can actually build and here's the constraints or uh, requirements for building something. So those are the things that, that 
fall into the long-term planning category. And the planning committee gets to review and advise on those things beforehand. I took a look at the, uh, since this meeting is ETJ related, I took a look at the Unified Development Ordinance. There are 26 references to U the ETJ in the Unified Development Ordinance. They are almost all, notice I said almost all, all in parallel with the phrase, the city of Charlotte and the ETJ. There are two things where it's not. And one is, if you'd like to have a farm, you can do it in the ETJ much easier than you can in the city, okay? And it's a certain type of farm. And there are a couple of other minor constraints in terms of reference to watersheds. So those are two places where there's a difference. Otherwise, there's no difference between the ETJ and the city of Charlotte, okay? So the, I don't know what those are, if that's, if that's something that people want to think about. The, we love you too. Um, <laughs> the history of all of those long-term plans is, is uh, the, of late. In 2018, the, the um, comprehensive plan process began and agencies were um, questioned all over the city in both the city and the county. And the county was uniquely a part of the uh, development of the 2040 plan. So those folks were involved on a monthly basis and a meeting called the Big Plans Meeting, which uh, apparently the county representatives led. And that began again in about 2018. Uh, other organizations, like for instance, Mech Playbook, obviously had to be a part of that because of Park and Rec. And some of the transportation planning was also a part of that, which would have affected folks in the county. Um, the other committee we have is a zoning committee. And Again, when we make zoning decisions, these are land use decisions. How can we use the land? And we have a very small number of criteria for how we can make those decisions. In chapter 38 of the Unified Development Ordinance, it's just sitting over there in front of me, which is, I normally I use it to prop up my computer, so it's right at the right height when you're on a Zoom call. Um, but there, in chapter 38, there's a criteria for making land use decisions. There are five elements to that. And I boiled them down to basically two. What's the context that we're making this decision in? What are the things that are around it? And what's the policy that has been put into place that governs this thing? Uh, basically, the 2040 plan and things of that nature. What are the policies that are involved here? Um, we get lots of input from county agencies along with city agencies. And I will note just some of the county agencies that, that provide input for us. Uh, stormwater, Louisa, Park and Rec, CM, CMS, et cetera. Those, whenever we do a rezoning, we get a packet that's a, a staff analysis of the, the petition. And each one of those agencies will contribute comments to that staff analysis. So when we're actually doing a rezoning, we will look at those comments. And sometimes, uh, for instance, we just did one a couple of weeks ago where I would reach out to stormwater to say, give me an exact number for how many acres of land are drained. And that is information that's useful in terms of helping us to make uh, a good choice in terms of zoning. Um, I have been on the zoning committee for the last four years. I have heard 849 rezonings. 92 of those rezonings happened in the ETJ. In none of those cases did we deal with those things in any way that was shape form fashion that was different than the other uh, 700 and something, 50 something rezonings. And that is how we make, make our decisions going forward. I think that right now, uh, Commissioner Lansdale is on the zoning committee. And I will say that uh, anybody that's heard me talk about the zoning committee knows that I brag on these guys. They do their work. They do their homework. We come loaded for bear with information, data, and we make good decisions. And I'm very pleased with the group that we have. And with that, that's an overview of the commission. Anybody got any questions? <laughs> so, Doug, I want to say, number one, thank you. What we're going to do is we're going to hear from Allison next before we go into questions. Okay. And I do want to acknowledge that uh, the county manager is here. And uh, I don't know if you want to just, no? Okay. She's, well, the county manager, Dina DiOrio, is in the room. Thank you, Dina. All right. Well, then uh, we'll hear from you shortly. And Elsa, I failed to recognize you earlier. Thank you so much for being here. 
I'm happy to Cheers. be here. Thanks so much for having me. My apologies. No worries. All right. Um, so I kind of wanted to go over a brief agenda. So again, so for everyone, I'm Allison Craig. I'm the planning director. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, sort of the framework for growth and how we are talking about managing that. And that really comes in the form of the Charlotte Comprehensive Plan and the UDO. I want to talk a little bit about what we're seeing on the ground and what we've been seeing come in and permitting, and then talk to you about some changes that we have been implementing and are recommending um, for this fall. And then it sounds like we'll have a discussion afterwards. Okay, so um, in the next 20 years, we are expecting to have uh, more than 400,000 new residents, more than 200,000 new jobs. And the city of Charlotte and Mecklenburg really did not have a vision for growth. We haven't had a comprehensive plan in 45 years. Um, and so we've spent the last few years really taking the time to develop a vision, develop a set of regulations uh, to address the unintended consequences of growth and development and recognize that we need new tools, uh, modern policies, regulatory tools to make development more predictable and easier to understand. So these are the plans that we've been working on over the last few years. You can see the Charlotte Future 2040 plan, which was adopted in June of 2021. That really sets the overarching vision um, for all of the other work that is layered underneath. And then the next layer is how we grow, how we connect and how we build. And that comes in the form of a policy map. It's like a future land use map. So like what we're desiring um, on the ground that was adopted in March of 2022. Uh, later that year, we adopted Charlotte's uh, Strategic Mobility Plan, and then finally the UDO um, that year, which went into effect in June. We're really focused now on this sort of bottom layer here, so community area planning um, that's intended to take sort of the overarching goals um, from the comprehensive plan and then start to talk about um, the 14 different communities because, of course, mm -hmm. while we have... Um, visions and goals for the entire city. We know that uh, our communities are all uh, a little different and they may have different priorities and needs in those areas. And that's really been a focus of the planning department over the last year and will continue to be for this year. And so as an opportunity and call to action, this is a great way for, um, for residents and community members to get involved in the planning process. Um, this will be gearing back up in the fall with additional workshops. Um, and looking to have those area plans adopted um, at next calendar year. And then we're also talking about strategic investment areas, where we're investing and how we're, um, how we're marrying, where we're investing with where we're growing. And then ultimately next year and um, in following years, we'll do an alignment rezoning to make sure that the zoning on the ground corresponds to what our vision uh, for growth is. So um, Douglas mentioned this briefly about the big plans convening. Um, I just wanted to say how much I appreciate the county partnership and all the work that we have been doing. So the people that are in bold are people that are currently involved in implementation of um, the UDO um, and the comprehensive plan. But we've had a lot of hands involved and a lot of thoughts and minds involved in shaping all of the work that we've been doing over the last couple of years. And I just wanted to say thank you to county staff for your partnership. So um, I saw Commissioner Griffin over there has his comprehensive plan with him. Douglas has his UDO and <laughs> Commissioner Griffin has his golf plan. <laughs> so we're covered over there if we have any detailed questions. Um, and I know he and I have talked about um, just recently about these individual goals. Like there's a lot of conversations right now about housing, um, you know, how much, where, all those things. But I think it's really important to take a moment and recognize that housing is not the only goal um, that we have. There are other things that relate to mobility, that relate to our natural environments, um, retaining our identity and charm. And I wanted to kind of um, mention just a couple of the specific policies um, that I think are important in the conversation. So tenement neighborhoods is something that is really important. This is a planning concept that uh, many cities that are growing um, have some version of this, whether it's 10-minute neighborhood, 15-minute neighborhood, 20-minute neighborhood. The idea is that you're wanting to encourage high-density, walkable uh, development near center so that you have all the things that you need, your housing, your employment, your retail, 
um, live, work, play type of thing all in within a 10 minute um, uh, walk or our transit ride. Um, in terms of neighborhood diversity inclusion, we spend a great deal of time in the comprehensive plan talking about this, talking about overcoming exclusionary zoning practices and allowing housing options throughout all of our residential areas. Um, we talked about uh, requiring a mix of housing types and larger developments, policy 2.9. And then I wanna mention a couple things as it relates to being fiscally responsible. Um, one of the things that we're really focused on right now is, is making sure that we're encouraging infill redevelopment um, in our centers. Again, that's implementing the 10 minute neighborhood. It's more efficient use of resources. And then um, one of the policies, uh, 10.19 was to create a multi-department um, committee um, to, to develop growth forecasts and analyze the impact of development. And that really comes in the form of this implementation committee that I was showing earlier. That's what that group is tasked to have. And I've, we've, had, um, we've had our CRTPO come and talk about regional transportation. We've had a consultant come in and talk about our growth forecast with that group. And I think it's a really valuable group to have. So um, I want to make sure, like, as we talk about the comprehensive plan and the UDO, they are two different tools that work together. So the comprehensive plan um, is visionary. There's nothing in there that is required by law. It is required by state statutes to have a comprehensive plan, but by state statute and by uh, planning um, best practices, you start off with a vision before you start developing rules and regulations for growth. So the comprehensive plan is the vision and the UDO is the legally binding regulatory tool to implement the vision of a comprehensive plan. Okay, so I wanna talk a little bit about what we're seeing. We're about a little over a year into the UDO going into effect um, and wanting just to take a moment and, and, and talk about what we're seeing. So the first thing is that there was a, so many conversations in the development of the UDO and the 2040 plan around duplexes and triplexes and concerns about uh, displacement and gentrification. Um, and what we have found is that we really haven't seen that many in terms of infill. I think we're in the probably about 250 duplexes and maybe 30 triplexes that we've seen in existing neighborhoods where someone has torn down a house and replaced it with a duplex and triplex. Um, we're not, we're, while you'll see a lot of cranes out there right now building apartments, there's no pipeline um, of apartments that are coming because the financing is really dried up, the construction costs are high. And so we have seen very, very little requests for apartments um, in our rezoning queue, and you're just not seeing a lot of development activity there. And I'm, from what I'm hearing from the industry, is that's probably going to continue for another uh, couple of years. What we are seeing is many, many, many requests for townhomes. And so in the rezoning process, they're coming through as subdivisions. You're seeing essentially two and three unit townhomes uh, being uh, proposed. They look like duplexes and triplexes, but they really are townhomes. And the reason for that is that, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, is that we are really in an affordability crisis here um, in Charlotte and many places throughout the United States. And so townhomes are naturally more affordable uh, for people to live in, and we're seeing a ton of requests for those. And then um, we've talked about this before, about 90% of the subdivisions that we saw before May 20th were being submitted as a conservation development option. That is something that um, I'll talk about in a minute, but that was changed recently um, in the city council meeting. Um, I want to just talk a little bit about past development patterns. Um, and so over here on the left, this is the city's capture of county building permits from 2018 to 2023. You'll see that Mecklenburg County had probably more of the single family detached than uh, the city did. And the city had more of the single family attached quads and multifamily. I really expect this development pattern to continue. Um, so this is probably something that we'll see going forward. Um, and then this again is a similar sort of layout of, um, of in terms of housing units, housing by units in the structure. So again, Mecklenburg having a little bit more of the single family um, detached and less of the um, attached units. Um, so this is a, a, a figure from UNC Charlotte. So this is Dr. Chu's work every year. Um, 
He presents the State of the Housing Summit. If you haven't been, I highly encourage you to attend. And what this graph is telling you, I know there's a lot of lines and bars and things like that, but starting on the left side is the price to income ratio. And I think this is really important because when we talk about affordability, I mean, even if homes become more affordable, if income's not keeping up with that, that's not going to help. And so you need to look at housing affordability and also what people can, can afford uh, via their income. And so this is, so the price to income ratio is the average price of the home uh, relative to the average income of a resident. And you can see that Charlotte is above four and we reached uh, above four for the first time in 2022. Um, this is like, once you reach four and above, um, by standard practices, that is considered unaffordable as a, as a community. Um, so this is, and you can see, and then this is the growth rate of that ratio. And so you can see Charlotte compared to a number of peer cities is at the highest in terms of that, um, that change getting worse. And so Dr. Chu talked about this in the summit. I'm sure he'll talk about it again in the fall when he brings that back. Uh, but that middle income housing affordability is a, is a huge challenge for Charlotte, and the solution uh, is to increase housing supply. So um, I've, I have a, a, a wide background. I've worked in all levels of government. I've worked as the developer, and most recently before coming to the city, I was a professor at UNC Charlotte, and so I taught this material in the classroom. And the reason why I'm even going to talk about it is that I think in order to achieve the outcomes that you're looking for, you have to actually understand the math problem. And so uh, development is a math problem. Your revenues have to be greater than your cost in order for something to be feasible and to be built. In terms of cost, the highest cost is the land cost um, or land carrying cost. And I think this is important to the conversation because one of the reasons why a lot of the conservation um, developments were, were occurring in the periphery of the county and the ETJ is because the land costs are less. Um, the other cost factors relate to construction costs. And in that construction costs, I will say some of that is infrastructure costs that now are requirements in the EDO that weren't there before. And then you, then you of course, have to pay back the people that gave you equi equity and pay back the people that gave you loans. Um, and really the only way to balance that is to increase the sales price or the rental price, which is not what we want, or you've got to increase the number of units. And so just pay attention to the, the orange and the, the teal green, because I'm going to come back to that a little bit, a little bit later. So in the UDO, um, effective June 1, um, we we spent a lot of time talking to the community, going back and looking at um, rezoning petitions and what was frequently required in those and wanting to build those in by right. And so um, I'll kind of hit on a few of these, like in terms of transportation, because that tends to be one of the more challenging ones. Um, we now require a comprehensive transportation review that includes multimodal requirements. We did not have that in the past. And so we're looking at how you're moving people around and not just how you're moving cars around. We've reduced the, uh, the trip threshold for traffic impact studies um, and now require them for buy right projects. We did not have a traffic impact study requirement for buy right development. It only came through in the rezoning process and most of the development occurs by right. Um, we had a lot of development that was occurring where people were, um, were putting everything into one large building because you got out of the street requirements by doing that. And so now we have requirements for building streets for just single buildings. Um, there's a number of new requirements for stormwater on infill on a single lot. Um, and that includes also heritage trees on single lots. And since UDO went into effect, um, we actually just had a meeting with Ebenezer and Patrick on Friday about this, like trying to make sure we're coordinated and how we work together because we are reviewing now 5,000 of those um, building permits that we weren't reviewing before for stormwater and for trees. Um, there's a lot of things that we've done in terms of street planning, uh, infill street tree planning requirements. The tree save for subdivisions has gone up. Um, we have a payment in lieu fee that is allowed and we hadn't updated that um, fee in lieu as it relates to the property tax value in like 10, 20 years. So we right size that. Um, we require community meetings for all rezonings, and we've got some new tools for um, neighborhoods um, 
to sort of empower them to create overlays in their communities to establish certain uh, character elements that they want to preserve. Um, in terms of things that we've added as it relates to sort of on, I guess, you know, the, the unit side or the housing side is that we allow duplexes and triplexes in our residential zoning districts. Um, in general, uh, heights are greater, particularly in our centers, and we allow those heights to go up um, in exchange for affordable housing. As you all know we can't require um, developments to include affordable housing in their projects by state statute. So we're really looking at incentives to help uh, address the affordability concerns. Um, we allow mixed income development projects to reduce their lot sizes to increase density and add flexibility. And we've removed barriers to building accessory dwelling units. And we're continuing to look at that. So um, we're about a year into the UDO. Um, and so we're evaluating what we're seeing. We're looking at what the market um, is, is happening in the market. And we've got some things underway that relate to residential development. So the first um, phase one, this was the conservation development. And I think, you know, I've talked about this a number of times. Again, this was a loophole um, that allowed greater density with lower quality development standards. Um, and I have these arrows here because it was a little controversial because I mean, this, what we put into um, the conservation standards, it increased the cost and it reduced the number of units. So I mean, when I talk about affordability, that's, you know, I, I recognize that that's not uh, helping that, but what we what we believe is that this was not intended to be the tool that everyone developed under, but it ended up being the tool that everyone was developing under. And so we had tons and tons of units and a lot of the projects that I've gotten emails from in uh, the, uh, about the ETJ, they were using this tool. That door is closed. Unfortunately, what was in the door and paid their fee, they're in the door, but that door is now closed. Right now we're working on compact subdivisions and this is a new tool uh, for modern and more efficient building permit uh, building footprints. Uh, there's a decision on that later this month and I'm gonna go into that one because I think it's really important for people to be engaged with something that we hope for action this, um, this month. And then the last phase, um, you know, in terms of cost and revenue and all those sorts of things, I think it's really depends on the location. So like this is starting to get into some locational considerations that talk about, you know, um, greater allowance for stacked quads. I'll talk about that again a little bit later. It's sort of that two up, two down, like a townhome is a great affordable option, but in terms of accessibility for handicapped or mobility impaired individuals, um, it doesn't work for those individuals. And a two up, two down, so two units on the bottom and two units on the top, there's tons of them all throughout the city. Um, is an allowance for, for those with mobility challenges. Uh, talking about maybe uh, limiting triplexes to corners only in low intensity district and uh, increasing the ability to build townhomes. So starting with conservation, again, this was adopted in May. Um, we required an additional 15% of green area and tree save and common open space for 40% total. Um, really probably higher than many of our peer cities um, using these types of developments. So the idea is you reduce your lot sizes, so you're protecting important green area. This is supposed to be a tool for sites that have environmental features. Um, and so we have moved this tool back into that place. We're requiring lots to front public streets and green areas. We're seeing tons and tons of alleys, which um, Made made it challenging for um, emergency services. In, um, there were no requirements for sidewalks or trees, and so now the lots um, have to front a public street, a green area, open space um, with with no private streets or alleys. And then we also added a perimeter buffer uh, requirement. So compact. This is the new tool. Um, we we had a development tool called. Um, cluster subdivisions that pretty much everyone used before the UDO went into um, went into effect. And this is trying to provide a tool back. And this would allow subdivisions that are two or more acres to reduce their lot sizes by 50% um, if they provide an additional 10% of um, usable common open space. Some of the requirements is that 70% of the units must run on public streets. There has to be a 25 foot buffer. We are limiting triplexes to only 25% uh, of the lots. It's kind of a rough math if you only limit, if you limit to triplexes to corners. Um, 
it would be about 25%. So uh, limiting lots um, in N1A and B. And so as written, this would include conservation um, uh, subdivision standards as well. And the important thing for this, con this uh, conversation today is that we would allow compact to be used everywhere like cluster was, but uh, we would not allow it to be used in protected and critical watersheds and the airport uh, noise overlay. So it really only leaves about 22% of two plus acre sites in the ETJ to be developable using um, uh, subdivisions. So again, this is st we're starting to look in, into locational criteria, thinking that going back to the 10 minute neighborhood, wanting to put density where it's most important and then wanting to protect sensitive areas like um, our protected watersheds. Um, I'll go over this really briefly. Um, I just kind of wanted to like, we don't regulate density anymore, um, but I have some density numbers here just to kind of, because I think some people it's familiar to them. So uh, before the UDO, sort of a base DUA for an N1A or an R3 site would be about three units per acre with uh, the cluster and tree save provisions that were in place before the UDO, you could get about 3.7, maybe a little higher. Um, the conservation that we closed the door on, we we're seeing as high as nine dwelling units per acre, which again, wasn't the intensity that we were looking for. Um, current conservation is, um, is about maybe a, a little over four if you're looking at this site, and then the compact um, could get you like four and a half to six uh, dwelling units per acre but with much higher design requirements than we had in the past. So, um, so there's three different options now. If you're wanting to develop a residential subdivision, you can use the base requirements. And so the base requirements are in place there uh, because they are lotting patterns that protect existing neighborhoods. And so we're wanting to keep those consistent so you're not creating irregular lotting patterns. And so you could develop in that way. We'll probably see that in the ETJ as we have in the past, maybe 20-ish percent of the sites um, would develop under these base development standards. Um, conservation, again, that has to be a five or more acre site, environmental constraints. This is a tool that would be allowed in the ETJ because I think there are um, areas there that uh, may uh, warrant protection. And so allowing people to not develop in that lotting pattern that's over on sort of that left column. We're wanting to condense the lot so you're protecting important environmental features. And then compact, again, is two plus acres. Probably the majority of sites that would be uh, developed as subdivisions will use that tool. But again, um, most of that would be um, in the city. And then the last um, phase that we're working on um, We'll be doing some research over, on this over the summer um, and then looking to bring this uh, forward to elected officials in the fall is really talking about residential uh, supply. And so wanting to right size our missing middle options for um, infill and for subdivisions, we've talked about, again, maybe putting triplexes on the corner um, in some of our lower intensity residential zoning district, increasing the allowance for quads, increasing the ability to build ADUs or accessory dwelling units. Uh, we've been meeting with a lot of affordable housing developers, trying to figure out what additional tools we can incorporate into this. But I think one of the important things that I wanted to mention today is again, townhomes are a uh, product type that is more affordable. You can see um, some research that um, a consultant that we have has done. So this is average home prices for new construction. And you'll see that single family detached um, is uh, a little over half a million dollars um, by average, and townhomes is a little over 400, while 400,000 necessarily is not affordable. You can see that single family detached is going up and townhomes is going down, and just wanting to have more ability to build these. And so, in the figure on the right, um, in that sort of hot pink purple color, those are our regional activity centers. Orange is community activity centers, and red is neighborhood centers. And everything that is in gray is a neighborhood one zone parcel. And so the idea is that we would take some of that gray area and where it's adjacent to centers, we would increase the allowance for townhomes to have more housing options and hopefully more affordability. And again, that would be in the fall. And that's it. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Allison. Appreciate that. So just so everybody's aware, we have one more presentation on May 31st. The board uh, received an update from our attorney with respect to um, authority uh, within the ETJ between the city and the county. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Attorney Wade at this point. Well, uh, do you need a mic? Thank you. Uh, I received several questions from board members concerning uh, the authority within the ETJ. So I crafted a memo that I sent to uh, the board answering the questions relative to how we got to where we are, the historical context, also uh, about some of the planning components. I reached out to the city to get some of the information, as you've heard the presentation today, um, and also what authority the board had relative to moratorium. And I've covered those provisions within the memo that I sent you. The, the board's actual authority now in planning really focuses only on one area, uh, which is uh, down in the south part by Pineville. Um, and you will likely hear, and I see that Patrick's on, so he can certainly talk from the city's perspective. Uh, you will hear uh, requests coming to the board at any time dealing with just that sliver of land um, in Pineville, all the other areas relative to uh, zoning and planning is really uh, been assumed by the city. So I think the memo is fairly self-explanatory if there are particular questions about what's contained in it. I won't go through it again for the sake of time and the uh, questions you may have, but that's basically what I responded to to the board in light of your question. Today. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're about to go to questions, but since we are in this legal space and I do see Attorney Baker on the line, uh, Attorney Baker, I don't know if there's anything that you'd like to add uh, prior to us opening it up for discussion. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to um, uh, to address any questions that you have. Uh, I have been having communications uh, with uh, County Attorney Wade on this just to make sure that we're all uh, in the same place as to what we can and can't do um, and happy to take uh, take questions. Okay, thank you. So I know there's going to be a lot of questions at this point, a lot of feedback and comments. So this is the way we're going to do this. Um, we're going to start with the committee members will extend out to board members. Uh, we'll also get uh, public feedback and also open it up to our city colleagues. But I'm going to put everybody on the clock. So with respect to committee members and board members, everyone's going to get uh, three minutes that includes questions and responses. So please get everything in. I think Carly, you timekeeper. Fantastic. Thank you. We'll go in this order. We'll go with Commissioner Rodriguez McDowell, Commissioner Meyer, Commissioner Powell, Altman, then Griffin. And you're up, Commissioner Rodriguez McDowell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, no pressure. Three minutes. Okay. God. Um I think. You know, I have I have tons of questions, but I, I really want to try to, you know, hone in on sort of my main concern uh, or one of my main concerns is around critical watershed and how the UDO applies in the critical watershed. And so you did mention that, um, Ms. Craig, about a, a different, uh, you know, um, tactic being used in in those areas but it didn't sound like it was it was one of the priorities um in y'all's process like you know there was a page where there was you know a whole bunch of circles and there's like you know the priorities and um i didn't really i really want to understand if there's a way um uh, and this is something i was trying to read into from attorney wade in that last page where uh he talks about what kind of authority the county could have. I'm trying. I'm, I'm not really great at reading legal documents and trying to, you know, like see what they're really saying. But is is there a way that the city can turn the ETJ areas over to the county for the county to sort of uh, apply a different process, or? It, is is that something that we really don't have that sort of ability? If they wanted to, could they do it? And I'll certainly, uh, Patrick, chime in. I do think the statute allows for there to be a relinquishment on the part of the city back to the county. Uh, if that is something that the board is uh, considering, then we would have to assume the responsibility that the city currently has in 
uh, carrying out and executing the zoning, the planning, and all those things that the statute is now given to the cities in the ETJ specifically. So it can happen, but you've got to put in place and replicate what the city is doing. Right. Okay. So here's why it, it might make sense for us to, to like, that sounds kind of crazy, right? Like, you know, my gosh, it would mean a huge um, change for the county. We would have to like hire people. We would have like, it would, it would bring a lot of work to the county. Um, but when we're talking about critical watershed and we're talking about the environmental protections that are needed, um, like nothing is too crazy to protect these important areas. And so it, it seems like if the city doesn't have the same um, kind of uh, lens of priority over these areas, then maybe it does make sense for the county to sort of say, hey, we want to take over this, you know, because this is super important to the county. So if I um, if I led you to believe that we didn't prioritize that, that's very that's far from the truth, and I apologize for not being clear. So essentially, if if this text amendment is approved by council, which we're requesting action on June twenty fourth, then the tool that I would say eighty five percent of subdivisions would be using for development they would not be allowed to use that in critical and protected watersheds. They would have to use the base development standards, which would probably produce a density that was comparable to what was allowed before the UDO, if not less. And so, so that um, we are prioritizing that and not wanting to use that as a place where you're incentivizing growth. And in fact, we are de-incentivizing it by not allowing this tool for housing um, options to be used in those areas. Okay, thank you. We'll come back to you. I, I know you've got a lot, you're a direct stakeholder, so you should get um, a lot more latitude. Uh, Commissioner Meyer. Um, and I definitely agree with you about um, six and one, district six and one, but um, so you'll have to forgive me because this isn't really in my planning, it's not really in my wheelhouse. Um, you it seems that like there's a contradiction on, I don't know the page, but it says um, tools in the UGO, tree fave exemptions removed. So, but then in another place, you're there in another slide, you you said tree save is a um, priority. I can't figure out. So um, in the UDO, uh, or before the UDO, we had certain types of zoning districts that were exempt from tree save. And so in the UDO, we remove that. So every every type of development has a tree safe requirement now because we do value that. Okay, okay. Um, so thank you for that. And then um, where it says 90% residential subdivisions submitted are duplexes and triplexes using conservation development option. And you said that that's changed and is and that is that's the one where in subdivisions that are already established, they're buying and building triplexes and that's changed, and that's the change that's coming. So the change that was approved is in in a subdivision. So in a large development, we were seeing developments that um, were using low quality standards, had lots of alleys, um, lots of development intensity, um, some some even all triplexes. And so now um, you are not allowed to develop in that kind of way, and you have to increase your uh, conservation requirements substantially. Um, and we are introducing a new tool to the compact development form that is intended to allow all those things, but we're not allowing it in critical and protected watersheds. So, um, so those 90% of developments were using something that we have taken off the table because it was, um, it, they were using loopholes to develop in, the, okay. in that way. In my district, in District 5, which is City District 6, um, big lot of um, upset people about the triplexes in the middle of a neighborhood. Is that, a, is that what you're talking about here? So that's part of our fall work is to look at triplexes. And we've talked about maybe only allowing them on corners in our lower intensity zoning districts. That's still a topic for conversation. And so um, I've heard a lot of feedback both for and against, you know, that idea. And I think it'll be a big community conversation in the summer and fall. Um, and it seems to me that, a, is it concerning to you that apartment construction is not in the pipeline? 
because that seems to me you house more people. Townhomes, you're not going to house nearly as many people. Right. So it, it is concerning, but we have had a, a large, um, we've had a lot of apartment building in the last few years. So okay. There's actually been some concern even from city council that maybe we're getting too much. And so like Austin has experienced some issues where they have too many apartments and they're having trouble with rental rates and things like that, getting them filled. And so we go about twice as many as we have. Wow. Okay. So I mean, I understand where that's coming from, but it goes back to there. We need to have a lot of housing options because not everyone wants to live in apartments. You know, so and so we wanted to make sure we have other opportunities for different types of housing. So we're watching it. I mean, I think it's it's important to have apartments, particularly in mixed um, like mixed use development. Like that's really a great opportunity. And so we're watching the market to see, but it's a challenge right now, and it has to do with funding. Thank you. Commissioner Powell. Thank you. Um, and thank you to Commissioner Rodriguez McDowell for talking about getting uh, the power back because when you had the slide up that was talking about the cost of development and, and the tilt on revenue, it feels like a lot of things are happening that are disproportionate environmental impact to make it more revenue friendly for developers, especially along the Catawba. And so in my district, in her district, in district two, there are significant developments that will directly impact number six and number seven, the healthy, safe and active communities and the integrated natural and built environments. And this is where we are hearing um, so much from our constituents. And I have to, like we represent the people, but we also represent the priority of stewardship, environmental stewardship and protecting natural resources beyond today, beyond revenue and profitability. We have to think of the long-term future of Mecklenburg County. And I was in a meeting where we, like we have significant feedback from community members who are outraged and they're not people that are NIMBYs. Like, I think a lot of times when we hear city council talking, they'll say, oh, that's NIMBYism. Sometimes it is, but sometimes it's just wise old people saying, wait a minute, they have no skin in the game. But I can think of this old timey farmer that stood up in a church one day and said, there's a reason it's in ETJ. There's a reason it's not developed yet. We were smart enough to protect our creeks. We were smart enough to protect the watershed. And that is definitely the case, you know, like in my district where we're trying to protect Mount Island Lake, our drinking water. And so, you know, I just wonder as we head into uh, drier conditions, how many of our leaders are really thinking about not only protecting the Catawba, but the limited water resources of the Catawba, you know, when developments are denied because the firefighters can't get the pressure they need to put out a fire in a certain place in Mecklenburg County, we are really like in a dangerous place for water resources. And so from our perspective, there's a huge gap in environmental protection in ETJ um, and some other places that you know, we reach out to some of the city council people. But when you look at the decision-making where you say, well, we're saving tree canopy and then the replacement, or I guess that's my time. Anyway, environmental protection is a big priority and and we might need to take back some of the authority. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank just, you, Commissioner Paul. Respond really quick. Um, I mean, I, I completely agree with you about the watersheds, which is why we are not allowing the tool out there because we want to make sure that we are not developing that area. It's not a priority. The other thing I wanted to mention is that um, tree canopy in particular is something that's very important to the city. Um, and we just got data back um, and it, it, it lends itself to an opportunity that we might actually be able to reach a 50 by 50 um, tree canopy goal, but 
the thing that was really important in, in the results of that study was that most, a lot of the tree canopy is in the ETJ. And so we will be doing a tree canopy action plan that will influence potential changes in the UDO in the future based on that feedback. And I think that's going to be a really important part of the conversation is that we've got a lot of tree canopy in the ETJ and what do we need to do to better protect it? So I just want to mention that. Thank you. Commissioner Altman. Thank you. I'd like to reference an April 16th uh, email from ETJ resident Nicolina Delgado, um, where she said, we as a neighborhood are not against development. We are screaming for someone to listen to us because this level of density out here is effectively creating a death trap for the current homeowners and everyone you jam out here with these buy right builds. Um, we cannot make the, the road in question um, private access because it is also an evacuation route on the nuclear power plant. Um, do people out here have to die again because of lack of holding developers accountable for infrastructure, supporting their development before you as city council will enforce anything out here? Young blood cannot support our 1500 home community and the other sub departments along Grand Palisades Parkway, let alone these proposed additional approximately 400 density homes. And so then you had um, let me know, let us know that um, the city had approved some text amendments and you very kindly sent to me the page that that is, which was page 413. But I don't understand how it helps or what it does that is responsive to the request that I just, to the concerns that I was just reading you, reading to me. Sure. So, um... What so what's in conservation, which is now adopted by city council, um, has much higher standards for public streets mm -hmm. and for open space. And so you will not be able to get those kinds of densities under those provisions anymore. And so we required an addition. So additional 15 percent of the site um, would have to go to open space and tree save and plus um, an amount that I wouldn't be able to capture the exact percentage of, but because you can go, you're going now from what was an alley to a whole public street, that's a lot more taken off the table. Thank you. Let me just interrupt you, Atlanta, because yeah. I have a little bit of time. When you approve, when the city approves new developments, it, it had, you know, Mr. Elton was saying exact same standards, but in the city of Charlotte, you're maintaining roads because they're your roads. In the ETJ, no one is maintaining the roads. So you can't apply the same approval standards in an environment where there's no infrastructure being maintained or created. So can you respond to that for me? So those alleys, the reason why we removed the, the ability is because they would be the responsibility of the homeowner down the road. And that like is an inordinate amount of money that they probably don't understand. So now we're requiring in those developments, if you were to develop in that way, that they have to meet public street requirements. And so then the city would be responsible for those. So I, I don't disagree with you about. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's not. Very okay. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so we, we want, we want the streets to be built to public street standards. And so, and not, so the city or the state. So depending on whoever is responsible for that entity, you can annex into the city or it can be the responsibility of NCDOT. Thank you. All right, Commissioner Griffin. And I'm gonna I'm gonna ask the public, you're gonna get an opportunity to uh address uh, to provide comment. And so just let let us go through this first, please. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. I'm going to start at the 50,000 foot level. We're going to go down to the weeds in my three minutes. <laughs> um, planning was not on my uh, dance card, uh, absolutely, until I'll give it to uh, Councilman Dredge or Councilman Graham, one of y'all. At some meeting, uh, a city council person or <laughs> chair said to some residents, y'all don't vote for us. Uh, you need to talk to county commissioners. Uh, there is absolutely no protocol, no operational protocol for county commissioners to respond to residents right now in terms of input into the process, zero. And we've had that discussion with our representatives and they say, well, yeah, there is no operational protocol. So that needs to be established. The statute calls for an ETJ re representation uh, and based on Chairman Welton's comments about two 
zoning committee, land use committee, I would hope my colleagues would be uh, supportive of two ETJ residents so that one could be on the zoning and one could be on land use until such time we can figure this thing out. Uh, the other is the 2040 plan. The 2040 plan, nice, wonderful words. It's a public policy piece, but it's not the law. And so where there's references to all the nice, pretty stuff in the 2040 plan, it is not the law in terms of UDO. So the UDO as written certainly is the law, according to the chair. And there's one piece getting down into the weeds, which is solid waste collection. As you create a lot of alleys, uh, your staff has written that, uh, and I quote, uh, this parcel sketch 2023-00233 is not in the city. Parcel is not located within city limits in the event the parcel is annexed until the city limits. Please review article 21 of the UDO. So I understand that the chairman saying that the 26 references of city county working together, there are areas I think in the UDO that should at least speak to development that's in the ETJ. And there ought to be some review of the UDO to make sure that the chairman is correct, that those things that are happening in the city are also happening in, in the ETJs. In terms of uh, the Palisade, I moved out there in 2006. Uh, we're gonna be annexed into the city. In 2007, the city of Charlotte made a request that the road does not have to meet state standard. The development was going to meet state standard. The name was Dan Clodfelter. And the, stat the statute was changed in 2007 to say build it in the city standards. So we're trapped in the Palisade based on what the city requested of the legislature. And the legislation that was passed said for any city, any municipality that's 500,000 city students, residents or greater, can now build streets to city standard rather than NCDOT. The, the poster child for that is right across the street is River Point, okay? River Point's adopted by NCDOT. Grand Palisade Parkway is not because of the city's request. And so all of the city streets, internal streets that are built out there, they be built to city standard, but they have to connect to a, a state adopted road so that you can then police it. Right now, you can't police it. And my time is up, and I had about three more wonderful things to say. I'm going to say them anyway. 40% um, uh, of the wage earners in Mecklenburg County are low wage earners. Okay, period. And so when you build something for $400,000, you're not building it for low wage. So this, this quote unquote, uh, housing priority has to be re reworked to address where the priority needs are. And that's for the low wage workers here in Mecklenburg County that don't make enough to be in those 400,000 pieces. The last piece is the county car marshal is not engaged when you're building commercial buildings in the ETJs. The city fire marshal checks off, but the county fire marshal does not. What I'm asking for is some alignment to Mr. Chairman's quote, the UDO is the law that the law considers the ETJ. Right now, there are gaps in the law, mm -hmm. and those gaps need to be filled. I got more, Mr. Chairman, but I'll thank, yield to my time. Thank you, Commissioner. I appreciate it. I promised uh, Commissioner Rodriguez McDowell we'd come back to her. Oh. <clears throat> well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, 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 this is this conversation has popped up so many more questions, um, but one is around the. Um, I, I really love what uh, Commissioner Griffin said about a separate policy on ETJ in the UDO. Like you know. Um, I, I do see, I, I appreciate the, the the things that you've already mentioned that you are doing um, that I did not know about with, with um, new rules around the ETJ. Um, but one question I do have is, are developers uh, incentivized or in any way, isn't there some sort of provision where if they want to be annexed into the city, they can, they can request it? Or like, I, I seem to remember that some places like say the, the uh, outlet mall, you know, ask to be or or opted in to being part of the city. Um, can these subdivisions do that, and would that help them, or does that is that cost more for them, or what, what's the deal with that? So, I mean, there's um, annexation requirements. Um, they have to meet certain proximity and things like that, and so um, those are those requests um, go through staff and the different departments review to check, you know, ability to service and things like that. Like, in fact, we had. A request recently that was deferred for a period of time because um, 
there wasn't adequate fire service for that until they resolved that. Then it came back through and, and um, came through the annexation process. And so there is, I don't mean to cut you off, yeah. but because of the folks that really are concerned about the roads mm -hmm. and how, you know, especially at Grand Palisades Parkway, you know, and things like that, making sure that folks aren't stuck with. So I know that w within the, the, the new um, projects that would come up that you have these road requirements, but what about the other roads that are connecting those little subdivisions, you know, to the rest of the world? That's where there's so much problem. And that's something I mean, I can, you know, that the road requirements really falls under the purview of Charlotte Department of Transportation. And so that's something I can have further conversations with okay. them about. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sure, thank you. So I, I just got uh, one thing, and, and I really would like some clarification because as I watch these emails going back and forth, emails from the public, emails from staff, uh, emails from my colleagues, one of, the, one of the areas where I'm disconnected is if, if the folks in the ETJ really, with respect to the issues that we're dealing with, don't have representation, they, they really don't have a voice seems like we're ping-ponging them back and forth with respect to trying to get their questions answered or addressed or really just just make sure that something is actionable for them. But they're in this sort of purgatory. What I'd really like to get a better understanding before I leave here, or before we all leave here, is where do they go? I mean, where, where do they go so we can stop this ping-pong? I, I, I don't, because I have no clue. And I, I just want to put that out there. I don't want you to answer it right now because I do want to get to them. But that's just one of the things that's swirling in my mind outside of, of what has been mentioned by my colleagues. So I'd like to get some understanding. And, and if we have to get back to that so that we could get to them, and I see some heads nodding over there, we, we can do that as well. But uh, what, I, what I'd like to do now is how many folks would like to provide some feedback? Because we are on the clock and I want to just see. So we have three three people that want to. Four. Four? Okay. So what we're going to do, I'm going to ask you guys to come uh, one at a time to the podium. We're going to give uh, two minutes to everyone. This is going to be feedback. What I'd like you to do, if you have questions, what I'd like for you to, to allow us some grace, we'll capture those questions and follow back up. But we'd really like to hear your feedback from what you've heard today. We'll give you two minutes because I do. And I, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Councilman Graham is here in the room with us. And we have Councilman Driggs on the line. So thank you both for uh, joining us as well, because we do want to give a minute to those guys to give us some quick feedback as well. So just one at a time, if you'll come to the podium, please. And uh, we'll set the clock at two minutes. Hello. Thank Hi. you, everyone, all of these um, city council members. Thank you so much, county commissioners. Um, I don't want to rehash anything, but I would like to add to um, county commissioner Altman regarding the roads that are not maintained by the city. You also have everything else that's under the roads, the sidewalk, stormwater, street lights, street trees, um, and sidewalks. So it's massive. And so I hear you when you hear, when you say, Mr. Welton, that you treat us the same, ETJ, the same as a city, but we're not the same as the city and we don't have the benefits of the city. Also would just like to point out is that if we're going to be working on trying to really resolve this problem, just my personal opinion saying that people are someone spending money like drunken sailors, I don't think is going to help us in getting um, to a place of resolution. Um, we do feel like orphaned and wanted stepchildren and because we have been i will this i'm not i'm going to paraphrase not using the exact word but according to a city staff member it's nothing but a ising contest between the city and the county so that's what you have people with the city saying <clears throat> why we can't seem to get get anywhere um when and how will the infrastructure be addressed so we just had 124 homes that were approved right there at that intersection of Grand Palisades Parkway and Youngblood. And they didn't even address a deceleration lane. They didn't address a turn lane. They didn't address anything. And supposedly it's not a problem. They just get to clean their homes in there. So the infrastructure is the biggest issue that just are not being maintained. I, I'm pretty sure that Michael Capri, Caprioli is going to address water quality management issues. Um, 
obviously privately maintained roads are going to be orphan roads and we're already dealing with that problem. So now we're gonna have even more. The issue as far as either building to city standards or state standards, good luck with that. We have Grand Palisades Parkway supposedly built to city standards, although it's not been confirmed. And as NCDOT won't even come to the site to tell us what how it's not built to their standards. Thank you, sir. Thank you. What's your name, ma'am? Thank you. Who's next up? And as you guys come up with you, let us know uh, who you are, please. We'd appreciate that. Absolutely. Good morning, everyone in the room and online. Hello, Mayor. My name is Javier Lopez, and I am president of the Steel Creek Residents Association, also known as SCRA. We have a 40-year history of collaborating with elected officials, government agencies, and developers to gain important ETJ improvements in Steel Creek that aren't always planned, budgeted, or delivered by our county or state in a timely manner. Look no further than Steel Creek Road, Highway 160. Why is there an SCRA? This is because of the need created when Mecklenburg County relinquished proper ETJ planning and zoning to the city of Charlotte. This representation gap has added to an overall feeling of marginalization in the ETJ community. Our legacy at SCRA is that of ETJ representation with past and current leadership all coming from the Steel Creek ETJ area. With the UDO, we have since lost critical visibility to stay abreast of the explosive growth of all the remaining two or more acres available in Mecklenburg County, nearly 50% are located in the ETJ. Out of the gate, the developments that the UDO has allowed have revealed the greedy motivations and self-serving creativity of brazen developers, which will forever scar our communities. SCRA warned of removing the guardrails and remains deeply concerned that without authentic improvements to the planning and development bodies and processes, UDO tax amendments alone can never address our ETJ concerns. Effort must be given to update and evolve the processes and entities that support infrastructure planning in the ETJ to match the buy right development that have been unleashed. I will leave you with some suggestions here concerning uh, ETJ representation and helping us to have a, a stronger voice in the overall plan. So, Thank you. Who's next? Thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrea Euler. I'm an ETJ resident, a member of the Steel Creek Residents Association, and also the UDO Advisory Committee. Um, I would like to acknowledge the work that city staff has undertaken to evolve the UDO, and I do believe that they are trying to address some of the concerns uh, at the county level and on behalf of the ETJ. Um, most recently, the, the conservation and compact tools um, uh, are looking to address the, the loopholes and the unintended consequences in our area. Uh, however, I am not certain that selecting the boundaries of the airport noise overlay and the conservation watershed go far enough I believe they are convenient boundaries and they will certainly have a positive impact. However, there are many areas in the ETJ outside of that that don't meet the uh, rest of the planning goals um, in terms of 10 minute neighborhoods, in terms of available transit infrastructure. Um, so I would ask if the city could consider um, really modeling and looking at where the appropriate boundaries are to apply those UDO text amendments. One thing I have not seen as well is any modeling 
of what the new densities um, under the N1 uh, uh, zoning classifications are. What would be the minimum number of units the area would be impacted by or the maximum number? Can the infrastructure that's there and proposed currently on the books for NCDOT, can they cope with that or not? I had a, a um, very interesting education from County Stormwater Services at a recent commissioner's meeting where they talked about the incredibly high impervious, um, <laughs> sorry, uh, the, the impervious um, infrastructure uh, across the ETJ and how it's growing far faster than it is across the city. So I do believe that that there um, is warranted more look at not just this conservation area, but the, the rest of the available land in the ETJ. If it's 45% of what's left to be developed, that needs closer scrutiny, including public engagement. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for allowing us time to uh, speak. I'm Michael Caprioli. I'm on the board of directors for the Palisades Master Association. We take care of the infrastructure issues in the Palisades, and I'm the lead for the stormwater issues in the Palisades Con Con Conservation Group. Um, one topic I didn't hear mentioned today is that the ETJ, it's like the island of misfit toys. You'll gladly take our taxes, but we won't get any services. There's also a gap in fairness. Do you know some county codes are enforced in the city and they're enforced in the county, but they're not enforced in the ETJ? Within the Palisades, we have some property that was there and developed and owned before the Palisades was developed. Across the street from one of our wonderful neighborhoods, an individual decided to put up a shed on his front lawn right on the street and park his fifth wheel right on the lawn, right on the street. It's against the county code, but guess what? County code doesn't get enforced in the ETJ. Is that fair? I don't think so. Uh, Stormwater. I had told Allison, if you want to plan, if you are serious about handling stormwater and the watershed here, in Charlotte Mecklenburg, look no farther than the Palisades Water Quality Management Plan that has been in existence for the last 20 years. Continual monitoring of the water and the soil, and guess what? It's always passed. I bet you the residents of Flint, Michigan wish that they had such a plan available to you. Um, it uh, The one development that you had up there, Allison, it shows the before UDO and after UDO. That area sits in a pocket surrounding the Palisades. So you've got the strictest water quality management plan in North Carolina, and now you're putting a high-risk development in the middle of it, and not shown on that diagram is a perennial stream that runs out of that property, through our property, through an Audubon Society of over 640 acres, and it runs unabated to Lake Wiley, your water supply. Um, one thing also to remember thank when you, you're looking at the plans, uh, federal bridge is unique, it considers trees and water barriers as the main piece. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we've got five minutes left, so. Thank you very much for allowing us to speak everybody. this morning. I guarantee you I'll be done before the music starts. <laughs> All right. uh, my name is Abdul Salangu. I am in the ETJ, but not in the Palisades. Uh, mine is a very simple one because I won't rehash anything that anyone else has said. But allowing the, uh, the requirement for the city to tie into existing private streets uh, presents another problem in itself for those communities that are smaller. I live in a community of about 100 homes. By forcing the developers to tie into our streets that we have to pay for, that we already can't afford to keep up to date, one mm. um, lawsuit from an individual who hits a pothole 
is going to bankrupt our HOA. It's very true. We can't afford to accept the traffic from forced pass-throughs, and we're tied directly into 160. Mm -hmm. So the city won't take us, and the state won't take us. Mm -hmm. Because if you build the city code, it's not; it doesn't meet the state code. We're stuck. I'm hoping that you guys will take that in consideration when you talk about um, giving some of the uh, authority back to the uh, county commissioners. Thank you very much for giving us some time. Thank you. You're exactly right. You felt an even ring. So I want to thank everybody for their feedback, for sure. Thank you for being here. Um, Commissioner Griffin needed uh, additional time. Just, just 30 seconds. Uh, I was communicated uh, that the streets are built to the city standards, but the inflation is talked about. There's a distinction that you folks need to understand the difference as it relates to traffic enforcement by the city police department. So on. Thank you. All right. So I, I do want to, in, a, in the next couple of minutes, um, give some runway to our city colleagues who are here. Um, and, and let me start with Mayor Lyles. Um, Madam Mayor, um, did you have any comments? All right. Well, we'll move on from the mayor. Um, Councilwoman Mayfield, um, get 30 to 60 seconds. If you had any comments, we'll go to Councilman uh, Graham and then Councilman Driggs. And again, everybody 30 to 60 seconds. And I would ask that you re really respect that time frame so that we can be respectful of everyone's time. Thank you, Chairman. And to all of the commissioners, I just want to say that I appreciate you all inviting us to this conversation. And I learned a lot and we'll be having additional conversations with staff to see how we can close some of these gaps and these loopholes. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Graham. Uh, same, I came to do a lot more listening than talking, so I'll yield the floor to the chairman of the um, Transportation Committee, um, Council Member Dres. I serve on that committee, and obviously, again, I wanted to do more listening than talking today. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Gr Driggs. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I hope you appreciate, I was the one that referred an ETJ resident who came to our hearing to the Board of County Commissioners when they complained about not having representation. Thank I you. welcome this conversation. Uh, what I'm hearing tells me that we really need to talk. Uh, the UDO is a 600 page document. It evolved over five years. It involved outreach to the community, the engagement of innumerable professionals. Uh, and basically it's an exercise in compromise. Uh, we are the fastest, one of the fastest growing cities in the country. We have a housing challenge and we have tried to figure out how to be sensitive to the issues you're talking about and deal with the issue of rising housing costs. So there's a lot more I could say. I would appreciate the opportunity to meet with you at greater length and, and describe a little more how some of these difficult choices were made. I don't think we're that far out of step and uh, I look forward to taking on board your input. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Councilman Driggs, and, and we'll accept that offer you just teed up and get something uh, scheduled. With that said, uh, Dean, I don't know if you or Dr. Johnson uh, might have any uh, thoughts or comments. Um, I appreciate the topic. I know it's a topic that we've um, been hearing a lot from residents. I welcome the door to have whatever collaboration or direction from this board as it relates to collaborating with the city, I do believe there's opportunities for us to try to make it better. And I'm very open to whatever that needs to be. And I'm sure that the city would be more than willing to come up with short-term as well as long-term strategies. Great, good. Okay. So with that said, Doug, I, I, I don't know if you wanted it 30 seconds real quick. Again, like everyone else, just appreciate the opportunity to talk and uh, continue the conversation. I tell people I believe in good ideas and I don't necessarily, you know, go one way or another. If you have a good idea, go with it. I've talked to the folks out in Steel Creek a good bit over the first half of this year and tried to hear what they're saying. If folks have any issues in the ETJ and not just uh, the Steel Creek area, I invite them to, to reach out to me and drop me an email. We'll have a conversation about it. And if we can move the needle, then we'll try and move the needle. Uh, as long as this conversation is going forward, then we are going to get to a different place that try and get everybody to be happy. We'll see how we'll do. Yep. So thank you. Look, uh, before we close, let me just uh, 
add a couple of comments. Number one, uh, first, I just want to say thank you, uh, number one, to uh, county staff uh, for putting this together, bringing all these stakeholders together. Derek, I know it was a, a Herculean effort. I want to thank the public for being here and for providing your feedback and your continued advocacy and, and putting us in a space where we're going to make sure that we're working together. Uh, certainly my colleagues and, and our city colleagues for being here in this work. I think what we got out of this is, is certainly there's a lot of opportunity for us to work together and to continue to try to make sure that we are addressing the concerns that were raised. And so uh, to Councilman Driggs's point, we certainly need to have a follow-up meeting uh, and subsequent meeting on this, and we'll take it from there. So at this time, I'll uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. Okay. All right, moved and probably seconded. All in favor, say aye. <laughs> Ayes have it. Meeting adjourned. Thank you. Yeah.